afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. We're gonna we're gonna get started here um, 30 seconds early. Uh, we have a lot to cover. My name is uh, Jason Gibbs. I'm the Governor Scott's chief of staff. There's a number of members of our team uh, here this afternoon. Um, uh, I hope you have an opportunity to meet some folks who you will be working with that you, you have not yet had a chance to say hello to. That's one of the reasons why we are doing this briefing series. Uh, we are going to limit this to a one hour per briefing. There is a lot of, of detail that we are going to skip over. Uh, these are intended to be very high level introductory briefings specifically tailored for folks who are not going to get more detailed information in your committees of jurisdiction. So if you're not uh, on a judiciary committee, for example, uh, this, is, this, this presentation is meant to be uh, for your awareness so you understand the types of issues that we're going to be bringing to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, so when you hear about them uh, over the course of the conversation in the legislature, you at least have a general understanding of where we're coming from and, and what our, our priorities are. But it's an hour, so we're going to keep moving. We're also going to try within that hour, in addition to covering a lot of ground, to create lots of opportunities or at least a few opportunities for folks to ask questions, engage in dialogue. This is a legislator briefing. Uh, I know we have some stakeholders and other interested folks here as well. Uh, there is some media covering these briefings both in the room and uh, online. That's great. Uh, stakeholders and media who have questions, we'd be delighted to follow up with you offline. Uh, legislators who uh, don't, uh, who have a question that we don't get to in detail tonight or uh, who think of a question when you're driving home tonight or whatever the case might be. If for any reason we can provide you with more details or answer a question that wasn't asked, just let us know. We'd be happy to get you that, that information. So again, it's one hour. We're going to move pretty quickly. We're going to cover wave tops. Uh, it is introductory. And as the session goes on, we'll of course get into more detail in all these areas. Um, I think with that, that covers all the, the basic introductory stuff. I'll turn it over to the commissioner who will lead us through the presentation. Thank you very much, Jason, and good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Morrison, and I'm the commissioner of public safety. Uh, I'm joined here tonight by several members of the public safety team. So if there's people that you want to talk to about uh, anything in this slide, there's lots of different perspectives here. We are also joined here tonight by uh, members from many of our other state law enforcement agencies. Um, and our partners from the Agency of Human Services. So there's quite a few folks here that if you have questions that we can, we can point you in the right direction if we don't happen to have all the answers. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with an overview of where we stand on the governor's 10-point plan. Um, as most of you are probably aware, uh, in August of this year, um, the governor issued this 10-point plan to address an uptick in violent crime that happened to coincide with a workforce crisis, an unprecedented law enforcement staffing crisis in the state of Vermont. So the conditions that we observed in the spring and summer are really what uh, led up to this 10-point plan and uh, in particular drug-related violent crime. And these uh, situations, the, the confluence of events have created a situation where there was not only a perception of a decline in public safety, but that there were actually a rise in certain types of crime in certain communities. And they're, they're, that's the birth story of the 10-point plan. <clears throat> so the governor directed me and other agency and department executives in partnership with everybody I just mentioned and well beyond that across the state enterprise, prosecutors and the judiciary, to implement the plan to reinforce frontline law enforcement capacity and to prioritize the reduction and prevention and prosecution of violent crime, uh, to expand prosecution capacity and help the courts address their backlog of cases, and to prioritize long-term violence prevention policies, systems, and services. And he broke the plan out into uh, the 10-point action plan framework into sections. And I'm gonna walk you through uh, most of the sections and Jay is going to address one right in the middle and then I'm gonna hand the presentation off to my colleague Dee who is going to bring us home with some high level policy uh, overviews. So point number one is in that first section of the 10 point plan which was to prioritize VSP mutual aid. 
And um, it probably is not a surprise to most of you that VSP is available 24-7, 365 uh, for call-outs with any case that exceeds a local community's uh, capacity to handle it or for certain type of special teams activations. Uh, we have 13 special teams that service the entire state. Um, in addition to that, in recent months, within the, the past year, VSP has uh, taken on the staffing of overnight emergency calls for service in multiple communities. We currently are doing that in four communities who have found it necessary to turn off their overnight shift because of lack of staffing. Um, in addition to doing these things and the business as usual and being the backstop for municipal and county law enforcement, we have been meeting regularly with representatives from the Sheriff's Association and the Chief's Association to collectively put our heads together to find the best responses across a wide range of areas, um, including recruitment and retention of new officers, training of officers, how we can assist each other in meeting the demands for public safety, and, and so on and so forth. I've already mentioned our 13 special teams that continue to support communities across the state. Um, and VSP has assisted or taken the lead on numerous homicide investigations statewide. Uh, and then another example of VSP mutual aid, point number one, is that in Burlington, the community saw a need for more uniform presence of police officers on certain days of the week, certain times. They entered into a contract with the Vermont State Police to use troopers who volunteer to do it on an overtime status. So it does not interfere with their primary mission, uh, but that they have the opportunity to augment the, um, the, the police in Burlington. So these are all ways that we have tried to address the governor's point number one. Point number two was to shift special team troopers to coordinate with the federal ATF task force, and that's what we did. Uh, we, we shifted some of our narcotics investigation uh, resources to be embedded with that task force and the BPD to address what was a significant uh, violent crime surge in that area. Those were very successful collaborations and resulted in all five homicides in Burlington in 2022 being resolved. Uh, multiple state investigators assisted with those. It was not just VSP, DMV had assets that helped and all the other state law enforcement agencies provided support to those investigations. Uh, there are still at least one, if not more, DMV investigator continuing to work uh, in the task force arena. Uh, we engaged with the Guard to bring in some counter drug analysts to help support the work from our, that is being done by our Narcotics Investigations Unit. And as, as I said, these partnerships, they are always fruitful, and this year they've been <coughs> extremely fruitful. You saw the large-scale operation down in Springfield in November, uh, which resulted in the arrest of multiple high-value targets and federal prosecution of those. Um, so that's, that's just some of the ways that we are meeting the, the request for point number two. Point number three was to better align and deploy state law enforcement resources. And bottom line, this is the governor, you, you saw it during the pandemic, he does not care what the name of your department or agency is. He wants state assets working together to improve public safety, to meet the needs of all Vermonters, particularly the most vulnerable. So we've been working quite diligently across uh, Department of Liquor and Lottery, Department of Motor Vehicles housed within AOT, across the Agency of Human Services, um, across the, the warden service um, to put our resources together and, and provide the best outcomes. I'll just give a little example of one. Uh, we now have a, it's set up that all on duty state law enforcement assets are visible. Like everybody knows where every state asset that's on duty is so a dispatcher can immediately decide which, which is the closest resource and who should, who should go first and then we can bring the right people in behind them if they're not the right one to, to handle the situation in the long term. But these are just some of the examples of um, bringing our leadership together at the operational and administrative level to find ways to be more efficient. A couple of examples that, I, that I've ref referenced in here. We found there were a couple types of investigations that we were doing concurrently with another law enforcement agency in the state. And it didn't need to be that way. It's just sort of how it had always been done. So we reduced some redundancies. Um, and we really have upped our game in terms of communication with state partners, again, by being visible, but also by um, <clears throat> meeting together regularly and making sure everybody has visibility into each other's priorities. 
Point number four was to augment the state law enforcement workforce, and I'm happy to say that this has morphed into an idea that is going to be enterprise-wide across the state because it is not just uh, law enforcement and first responders who are having significant staffing shortages. Um, the Human Resources Department is working on a returnship program that would allow people who have left service to state government to return um, and, and not impact their pension or whatever you know, the, the, the reason is that they might not want to return. Um, and we are prepared to implement this program at the Vermont State Police. We have identified several areas where we could use the resources of re retirees if they choose to return. So more to come on point number four. And at this juncture, I'm gonna move into the next area and turn this over to Jay Johnson, the Governor's General Counsel. Hey, Commissioner. Just Briefly, I know we're trying to roll, but I'm wondering if we should pause and, and sure. take a few questions on that portion of the presentation. We can keep rolling. Okay, let's keep rolling. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. I am Jay Pershing Johnson. I'm Governor Scott's legal counsel. Uh, I work mostly with Governor Scott's staff, but of course, during the legislative session, I'm available to answer questions and work with legislators who are you know, interested in working with us on legislative proposals. Um, in connection with the 10-point plan, what we decided to do is um, ask, essentially, the, the, the direction was, sorry, <laughs> um, coordinate with the Attorney General to allocate prosecutorial resources effectively. And what we really meant by this was working with the AG's office and the state's attorneys and the U.S. Attorney's office to best allocate and align prosecutorial resources across the state, similar to sort of what Jen was saying. We obviously have a 14-county system of prosecutors, and the AG's office has concurrent jurisdiction. So there are some areas where it's appropriate for the AG to maybe step in, handle major cases. Um, so we worked a little bit with Attorney General Young to sort of re-energize the work of the Attorney General's Office Criminal Division and um, to sort of talk to them about how they might be allocating their resources in connection with major crimes prosecutions. We are really hopeful and, and I'm very optimistic. We recently had a meeting today with the Attorney General Clark and I think she is going to continue their participation with us on the task force that Dee will, will be discussing. And I think that we are um, going to have a lot of areas where we can uh, talk to the AG's office about prosecutions and the use of the AG's office to augment prosecutorial resources across the state. Um, we've also um, worked on restoring coordination between the AG's office and the VSP narcotics investigation units particularly at the outset in the um, northwestern corner of the state. And um, at this point, I mean, the AG's office will largely defer to the state's attorney's offices if they're going to pick up a major prosecution. But if the, um, if the Vermont State Police Narcotics Investigation Units want to embed the AG's office, uh, that is something that they are discussing with the AG's office at this time. So that is um, another way that we've been working in this plank of the plan. Um, we are also working, we started a conversation with the judiciary to eliminate the judiciary's backlog of cases. Obviously there's not a lot that the executive branch can do with respect to the judiciary's backlog. A backlog existed pre-COVID, it's um, much worse post-COVID for a number of reasons. But um, the problem obviously is uh, delayed justice and accountability and service delivery for alleged offenders, including um, a growing DOC detention population, um, as well as delayed justice and restitution for victims and communities. So this is um, the impact of the backlog on the community violence issue that we have been concerned about. Uh, I think what we've realized is that all three branches have to recognize and address systemic issues that are causing the backlog. Um, two issues that were identified for us by the judiciary where we do intersect is in the DOC, which is handling a lot of remote uh, proceedings. Um, there are just some issues operationally that the DOC can't handle. They're not set up to be courtrooms. So how do we most effectively work with the judiciary and the legislature to address those issues? 
um, as well as, um, I mean, we have, that group has also identified a small group to identify or to work on um, some issues case by case, but there are some systemic issues that need to be addressed as well. Um, we've also identified issues with competency evaluation orders, primarily the volume, which is causing a lot of the backlog, and is threatening essentially to undermine the system because we have a system where we effectively right now have one competency evaluation evaluator in person and a telehealth provider that is unwilling to continue service unless the state does something to reform its system, which creates a lot of volume. Um, competency, of course, is required before you can participate in um, a, a, a criminal proceeding. So, um, Jay, Jay, real yes. quick, on the, on the competency issue um, and the vendor's frustration, but as a way of illustrating the uh, challenges in the judicial system, can you explain a little bit more, like what the vendor, what our telehealth competency provider is fr most frustrated by? Well, so they're most frustrated, I think, and um, Commissioner Haas is here can maybe answer some of those questions if I don't get it right, but I think what they're mostly seeing is that in Vermont, the volume of requests for competency evaluations is essentially overwhelming their ability to perform the work. So they, um, I mean, basically when you, you initiate a criminal proceeding, a, a defense attorney typically, or sometimes the court will request a competency evaluation because they believe that their client is not able to effectively participate in the proceeding. You have to be competent enough to understand what's going on in the courtroom. This is a very low bar, uh, but there are a number of reasons why the state's system simply facilitates those requests as a matter of pro, you know, a process, essentially, at this point. Um, so we think that there are some improvements that can be made to the law, which will not have an impact on individual rights, but will have some impact on the current volume of requests. Uh, another thing that's been particularly frustrating is some courts don't believe they have the, um, the authority to order medical records for the competency evaluation. And without medical records, an evaluator can't actually effectively evaluate competency. So some courts don't believe they have the uh, authority. Some defense attorneys don't believe that they have an obligation to ask for them. So we just need, I think, a tweak to the law to ensure that courts will order medical records at the time they order a competency evaluation. Uh, we think that some of this may actually have an impact on the volume of requests that are made. Um, so that's it, uh, unless you have any questions on those two items. Okay, so we're moving into the last section of the 10-point action plan framework, which is to prioritize long-term violence prevention policies, systems, and services. Uh, point number seven was to expand the role of the Fusion Center, the VIC in Vermont, and I just wanna make sure everybody's following the acronym. The VIC is the Vermont Intelligence Center. It serves as a fusion center, but we don't call it that anymore. Um, and the, the VIC currently collects, analyzes, and disseminates intelligence information to identify, investigate, and prevent criminal activity, and also to prevent people and Vermont's critical infrastructure. So the intelligence side of the house is very robust and it's well built. And what we are trying to do is grow uh, another side, another dimension to, to the VIC, which will work on um, trend analysis, like data analysis related, not just to criminal, criminal activity, but also to other pieces of information that we have inside the state enterprise that could help us um, have effective situational awareness and intervene in situations or provide services in situations before they develop into a criminal justice encounter. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but um, basically we're trying to do the best we can to grow the capabilities of the VIC to go beyond the receipt of intelligence uh, streams of data and turn those into actionable items for the field, but also to now be able to do the, the very um, precise work of being able to deploy our diminished law enforcement and other social service 
uh, resources in the most precise way possible. So to identify people, places, and behaviors based on data and direct the resources there. So we are moving in that direction. As you all know, it doesn't happen overnight, but we, we have a plan, so more to come on that. And point number eight, which I would say is, um, it's so big, this could be its own plan all by itself, point number eight. Um, the governor has directed all relevant state agencies, departments, divisions, all the state assets to work together in the same model as the pandemic response. Again, no silos, everybody comes together. <clears throat> and the goal is to meet at least weekly to identify and track hotspots, repeat offenders, others known to law enforcement and social service providers, to swiftly deploy needed interventions, and or services and to actively disrupt patterns and prevent interactions with the criminal justice system. So it, this, this strategy acknowledges that violent crime is a symptom, often a symptom of misguided policies or inadequate resources, inadequate coordination between programs and systems. And it's an acknowledgement that we cannot enforce our way out of a violent crime epidemic, okay? And uh, the other factors that are wrapped up in this. So some of the examples of what we've done to be responsive to the governor's request to come together across the state enterprise and, and respond like we did to the pandemic. We have weekly meetings of the public safety enhancement team that I'm gonna explain more about in the next slide. We've created a heat map. Uh, it's still under revision, but it is pretty exciting. Um, I'm gonna show you that too. Uh, we've met with the chiefs of the eight hottest communities based on our, on our heat map to ask them if this matches what they think is happening in their community. Yes, it matches. To ask them if they have a plan to address it, to try and gauge the level of interest in, in, in going further with the collaboration with state assets. Um, and going further uh, in that collaboration is, is being piloted with the town of Bennington. So we're in the process of, build, of a structured engagement process that will bring state assets from across the enterprise together down with the local stakeholders, the local government, the governance, the hospital, the schools, um, and try to bring all these stakeholders together to develop problem statements and action plans to increase the public safety and access to social services in Bennington. So that work is ongoing right now, and we are planning to, uh, the next big, um, shall we say, benchmark in that project is going to be a summit, a day-long summit, where we do a lot of the face-to-face the, um, -face talking and really getting deep into the action items and timelines and stuff. More to come on that. And then this being our first community in Bennington, it's taking us a little bit of time to build the right engagement process. This is not meant to be a paternalistic thing where the state goes in and says, hey community, we know what your problem is. We're here, we're from the state, we're from the government, we're here to help. That's not what this is at all. This is a full-on, engagement and inventory assessment, building of relationships, and trying to leave, um, just trying to help communities be more resilient uh, and have better access to the available state resources and that they would know who to call and those relationships would be strong by the end of this engagement piece. And we intend to replicate this in other hot communities during the course of the year. So what is the public safety enhancement team? It's, our goal is to reorient policies and improve coordination among programs and systems for better health and safety outcomes. So the agencies and departments that have been directed to apply the state's nation leading pandemic response um, come together regularly to measure activity and respond in as near real time as possible, identify causal factors and take action to prevent crime and better serve Vermont's most vulnerable. And the critical work of PSET is to identify hotspot communities, as I just mentioned, for prioritization to swiftly deploy needed interventions and or services to actively disrupt patterns and prevent interactions with the criminal justice system. And the next slide is a picture of, whoa, where'd it go? Hold on. It's like my big reveal. The black button. Better let John do this, or we know we're going to have trouble. Yep. 
you had it, it was just a miscarriage, I think. It's like the suspense is building. I wonder if it's the actual image. It's not rendering. Okay, so I'm gonna try and turn, I'm gonna have Jason turn this around so you can at least see what I'm talking about. Oh, you have hard copies. See, look at me, I could have kept talking. My oh, bad. Uh, okay, so you have a picture of the heat map and there's a lot of information in this heat map. Some of the sources of data include, um, and I wanna just put right up front, it's, these are imperfect uh, data sets because we're trying to use as near to real-time data sets as we can. So we're using, for instance, in the law enforcement realm, we're using um, call type data, the type of call that a, a, an incident is labeled on as, excuse me, that might not be what is reported to NIBRS three or four months down the road after the incident is fully resolved, the data reporting has been fully vetted, and it goes off to the FBI. This is as near real time as we can get for the law enforcement calls for service. We also have a layer of data in there that has plucked out certain types of responses by EMS from their um, records management system. So um, responses where the primary reason for the call is overdose or assault, those types of calls are coming into this heat map as a stream of data. There is information pulled from the Department of Health on types of prescriptions by class per county. So each county's rate of prescriptions for uh, stimulants, benzos, the different, the medication, MOUD, those types of um, prescriptions are all represented on the heat map. Um, <clears throat> We also have uh, rates of, re of visits at emergency departments where the primary complaint is overdose. Uh, that, is in, that, that is in there. The death rate by overdose, which is represented uh, by, the, uh, by the Vermont Department of Health. So there's a bunch of different data streams that we've tried to pull to make it beyond law enforcement specific, but that it shows where the need is, where, where, where there's need in our community. Um, the heat map is reasonably interactive for people who are users of it, and there's only a few right now because it's still under construction. But every week, we add in the most recent week's data and we drop out the old week of data. It is a six months running snapshot, a running six month uh, look at what's going on. It's not intended to go back years or anything. We just want to keep kind of our finger on the pulse of where the hotspots are in the state. And in, within those communities, you can drill down into the community's map uh, and see what's happening. All of the information is de-aggregated to the block level, to the 100s, of blocks of 100s addresses. So it's not you know your address showing up as the uh, location of a call for service. Um, and then each week, you can see that uh, we have certain buckets of crimes that are, are counted specifically. And then we have uh, the other data I told you about. It ranks the towns as the hottest or not, depending on how you toggle the switch. And then they, it further breaks down the number, the raw number of calls in the bucket by the 10,000 residents. So just because the number in Burlington might be higher in the aggregate, when you sort it by the 10,000s, you find out that it's not as hot as say, Springfield was that week or whatever it is. Um, we also have a layer of artificial intelligence in here that calls out anything that's out of range or anomalous. Uh, so we have sudden jump and out of range as the categories there. And you can see on this one that the la last week, this past week, 
Bennington is wildly out of range for burglaries. Their expected range based on the six month average is zero to one burglaries per week and they had 11 last week, reported last week. So the artificial intelligence is designed to make sure we don't miss any big bumps or spikes, but we're, we're, we're tracking those because there's a trend line that you can drill down into um, to see what the average number either statewide or in a community is of these violent crimes in any given week. There's also on the agency by agency page, you can look at when, what hours of the day and, and days of the week are the most likely to have um, these violent, violent crimes come in and be reported to the police. So it is not a perfect tool and it is still under revision, but it's the most real time uh, depiction of where the crises, shall we say, are happening in our community. And we're looking forward to refine, continuing to refine it and share it with the local communities to help them direct their limited resources while we at the state level direct our limited resources to those spots. This is a, so this is a really very exciting tool. Um, it provides uh, a, as, as the commissioner pointed out, as close to real-time intelligence analysis as we can develop at this point in time. We're gonna continue to work on it, but it is already uh, showing uh, at least the ability to measure the results of our effort in some specific areas. So specifically, what I mean by that is we watched the activity in Springfield decrease after the large, the large law enforcement effort that you probably read about in November. We've seen uh, types of crimes, particularly our most concerning types of crimes, decrease in Burlington and in Northwestern Vermont as the law enforcement activity has uh, focused on those areas. The, these types of tools, like what the commissioner is talking about, give us the ability to be more responsive, which is important because law enforcement is facing the same workforce challenges uh, as, other, as other sectors, so we have to be super smart about resource allocation. The, the dots that have to be connected are between the vacuum that we create by uh, surging law enforcement activity into a region or a community and the social service outcomes. So when you disrupt, I'm gonna, this is hypothetical. When you disrupt a drug supply chain significantly in a particular region, is your human service apparatus, are your human service assets part of the tactical team that is carrying out the law enforcement activities so they get a seamless handoff. So they go right on the ground to the, to the, the residents who need the human service at that point in time or over the coming days because the, the, they're gonna be searching for a new supply. Um, are we meeting the needs of families who have been the victims of trauma because of activity of people who live in their houses and is, is that work truly coordinated on the ground? Like that's the COVID response that, that the commissioner talks about is integration of all these state assets at the operational level on the, on the ground. So we're not waiting for referrals or people to call 211 or what have you. There is a direct connection between the intervention and the service. That's a, uh, Easy to say, very difficult to do under the, uh, based on the way that our enterprise is constructed, but this tool is a pretty significant step forward in our ability to understand our operating environment um, with a higher level of specificity. I think the people on the ground will tell you they understand the operating environment very, very well, but now we're able to measure it with a much higher degree of specificity, uh, more frequent rate of measurement, and then we're able to share that information with all of you. So I'm gonna pause there and ask if there are any questions. Go ahead. Um, I'm just curious if you could share more information about what artificial intelligence systems are being used because um, it's, there's nothing on this inventory that was released by ADS related to this, um, this work. So I'm just curious, and maybe that's because it's new, but I'm curious if you know what system is being used and what kind of AI. I don't, but I can talk to my ADS partners because they, and, and I was actually, as Jason was explaining this, I was remiss in not saying that ADS has been a crucial partner in all this and they're not in the room, I don't think, but they have been super, super um, integral to getting us to this point. Um, so do you uh, have what, answer? Representative, we'll, we'll, we'll find out for you for sure. It's a, it's a data spike flagging tool. I think um, uh, 
AI makes it sound like something super scary, but it's like, hey, when your data jumps beyond this particular range, you get like a notification in your email inbox that's like, hey, you might want to look at this data. And when we do, you know, get towards the finish line of thinking it's as good as it's going to get on the heat map, there's going to be like a clear context within which we present this data with things like that, that this is what we're using to detect sudden jumps and out of range. Um, and, and staying straight up up front, this is not perfect data. Like this is not the data that we would use to put a grant application in looking back three years of data, right? Uh, but this is a real time tool. So I appreciate the question that, hang on a sec, there was a question about that. Tony, next to you, no, no. Ma'am, did you have a question? No, thank you. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah, Commissioner, um, who, who uh, conceived this map? I mean, is it? Who conceived it? Yeah, no, no, who conceived it? Oh, who can, can see, see it? it. I was yeah, like, who is, can is see it? Is it publicly available? Is Not it yet. just available to law enforcement? I and mean, what are the plans uh, on that aspect? That is a great question. So today at our PSET weekly meeting, we were talking about just that. And for now, once we get it to the point where we are confident that it should be published, we are going to be publishing PDF stills of the um, this cover page that you see. There's a second page that shows you what the different data sets are that go into it. And then probably what we'll end up doing is doing like the top six or eight hottest communities each week will publish their individual page. It is, it is envisioned that we will get to a place where we can share it with local partners and, and let them use the interactive nature of it. For instance, you can filter in or out the EMS calls. You can filter in and out you know, certain streams of data. Uh, to be a, a little more precise for what your purpose is. And we would like to make this a tool available publicly. Um, we're not quite there yet, and it requires certain licenses that do cost some money, because it's a kind of fancy system. But um, we're, we're working on it. So we're, we're thinking stills first on a, on a weekly basis uh, that folks can come and look at, and then hopefully we can turn it public facing with an interactive, some features anyway. Jim, absolutely, will be public eventually. Think uh, along the lines of our COVID dashboard. That's the type of type of tool we're trying to make available to folks. So I, I, listen, I appreciate the transparency. I would love to be able to get online and look for this information. I also know that you know even these larger communities listed are small in relative terms. In a few cases, can give you the wrong impression uh, of a community, which can have a lot of other. So I just, yeah, it's a great tool. Point well taken. Yeah. Oh, we're still the safest if, or second safest state in the nation. So let's be clear, we are a medium city in the big landscape. Well, I'm not moving to Rutland this week. Um, <laughs> so, um, maybe well, Chittenden, but not Rutland. Maybe, maybe Chittenden. But anyway, so the heat map, more to come on that. If there was some reason why you had a specific need that you wanted to talk more about that, we're, we're not to the final public facing phase, but I could certainly jump on a meeting with you and uh, share screen, et cetera. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. So that was my question, but then a follow up to that is what's your time frame on having this available to the public? Is it like a month? Is it two months? Where do you think you may be involved? Without consulting with the ADS folks who are the brains behind the operation, like we're like, give me this, give me that, can you show it this way, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, yes. Um, 60 to 90 days, but I can't, I, I can't promise without talking to the brains of the operation. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. I'm going to stand up so it doesn't appear that I'm hiding behind <laughs> this gentleman here. Uh, Christy Morris, our representative from Springfield. Uh, you mentioned the Springfield a couple of times now. And I just want to give a huge shout out and kudos to uh, the, the coordinated effort from the different agencies to respond to critical situations in communities such as ours. And uh, it, the flashbang approach was uh, was beautiful, made for TV, and uh, I can only compliment the officers and the, uh, the agents that uh, responded. And uh, it's a coordinated effort such as this that is going to be the only answer. Because towns can't do it themselves, communities can't do it themselves, and police agencies can't do it themselves. So I want to thank you for the efforts, and I want to thank the officers and um, the department heads that Thank you, sir. The Colonel's here, and I'm sure he'll pass that along. I want to take that opportunity to say, right, we can't enforce our way out of this, right? So it has to be a team effort. Um, and imagine the, it was a beautiful operation. It, it was a beautiful operation, and it's one of many that happen each year, but 
Imagine this happens again in three months, similar situation, same law enforcement action. Imagine that that is followed directly on the heels of, as the cops are rolling out of town, AHS and all of their social services are rolling into town, and maybe we've got EMS providers who can provide medication-assisted treatment in the absence of that in the local community, and maybe we've got signing up for economic services and trying to help people get their life together at that critical moment in the wake of a disruption of the drug supply. Like meeting people where they are with as many resources that the state can bring to bear. And, and amplifying that by being in such close contact with the local partners that they bring their services and we are meeting people where they are in their community in the wake of a major incident. So that's sort of where we're driving towards is to acknowledge that we can't enforce our way out of this. We know we have to enforce vigorously but we have to be holistic in the way we respond to communities because at the end of the day, we're just gonna keep kicking in doors and taking off drug dealers until the, the, the demand for drugs drops or goes away. Go ahead, sir. To follow up on what you just said, when you roll into these communities with all these agencies to, to help folks, uh, what, what are the results of that? Do they want help? Do they get the help? Do they act appropriately with the help? And in the future, do they, do they recover from what they uh, are involved with and become productive citizens, or is it a waste of time? Can't answer it, because we haven't quite achieved the, the vision yet. Uh, but of course, we would have metrics built into anything we do, because if the juice isn't worth the squeeze, then we're not going to keep squeezing, right? Um, and, and, you know, I spoke about Bennington and this community engagement piece, and that really is what the lead up to this summit that I described is about. It's about assessing the willingness and the capability of the local community to really honestly inventory their own opportunities, but gaps as well. Likewise, on the state side, we have been going through a months long inventory of what can we bring to the table in these local communities. And that the work up to that actual summit is where a lot of this work happens of assessing the willingness and the ability to make changes that are going to be impactful and make communities healthier and have a stronger social fabric in, in the wake of it. It's not like we're gonna go into a town, walk in for a day-long summit and roll out and never talk to them again. We're trying to figure out a way to walk alongside them to amplify all the available services and then build stronger relationships between local and state resources. You'll see, you, you will see, we do track um, performance, key performance indicators in all of our major areas of operation. So um, in the substance abuse space, for example, we are tracking on a weekly basis, on a regular basis, at least weekly, what the overdose rates are, what the incidents reporting to ERs are. So we can over, among other recovery and revitalization metrics, we'll cover more of those in the healthcare conversation that we'll have. But you're asking, exactly the right question that every legislator should ask in every single policy area, which is, what are you going to measure to demonstrate results? If you ask all of our people that, it would be uh, helpful, and it would help us continue to cultivate, I think, pockets of excellence in public service. There are a number of them across state government that we can all be very proud of, but, but it's, a, it's always a work in progress. Uh, number one. Number two, there are still some areas that don't really measure output. They just measure the work that we're doing by how much we're putting in. Yeah, which I don't care and, about. And, and so, if you, but you're asking the right question, and we do have key performance indicators in, in substance use and other recovery work. Um, we'd be happy to share those with you. Thank you. Go ahead. My name is Joanne Triano. I'm a representative from uh, Edison Rutland District. Um, and I'm sorry, it came in a few minutes late, so I guess it's possible this was covered. Um, but I, I come from a very rural area, and there is a perception, and whether or not this perception is true, I don't know, because I haven't looked at the data. Uh, but there's at least a perception that if you call 911, you'll get lucky if someone shows up an hour later. Um, and so I'm wondering um, whether that perception is true, um, I guess, number one. Um, number two, um, you know, where are some sources of data that we could look at to see what the realities are when it comes to response times in rural in rural areas of our state? And if that perception is true and the data does bear that, you know, anecdotal observations out, what things are we doing to try to um, get response times to be better in rural areas? Because you really are out on your own if you're in the middle of nowhere and 
someone breaks into your house or attempts to commit a crime or something like that, and you're, you're sort of stuck, um, you know, just being on your own. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, great. And I, I feel that living, I've lived very remotely as well, and response time can be a long time. Um, we do measure response, response rates. Uh, it takes manual labor to cultivate those response rates in terms of like if we're looking at a certain community or a certain region. Um, the highest priority emergencies get the quickest response time. But the reality is that sometimes your resources, whether that's a trooper or an ambulance service, may be coming from a long distance away. Um, they may be received the call while they were asleep in bed at night, have to suit up, gear up, get in the car, and drive to your location. So if you tell me that there's an hour response uh, time, I'm gonna say, yep, that's possible in, in many circumstances. Um, it is the nature of living in a rural area across the country, not just Vermont. Uh, I'd be remiss if I did not point out that we have 50 vacancies in, amongst our sworn ranks in the state police. That's a lot. 50 out of 330 is a lot of vacancies. Um, we have shifted resources out of other types of areas and into the patrol sector. We are doing our very best to meet the need, but um, I, if, if you have a specific concern about a, a, a response time, the Vermont State Police can absolutely investigate it and get you some of that data. But what you're telling me doesn't surprise me. And the last piece of, of uh, your, your question or your, your statement was, the perception is, and I was a police chief for a long time, I was a police officer a long time, and people's perception doesn't always match reality, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because their perception is how they feel, and it is our job to make them feel safe and taken care of. So perception and reality don't always match, but we have to be really dialed into what people's perceptions are. We'll make a note to follow up on specific towns. On the specific yeah, towns. or if you want to contact me and ask about specific towns, then I can find someone to get that. That data. You can't all ask me at once. Jen, in the interest of time, um, we should pass it to the. Yep. So, the last two points on the governor's 10 point plan relate directly to my colleague, Dee Barbic, uh, reconstituting the Violence Prevention Task Force by executive order. It's been done. And point number 10, John, can you advance? Uh, was appointing a director of violence prevention, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dee Barbic. The only applause. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so as Jen mentioned, uh, I was recently appointed as the Director of Violence Prevention. And with that, I oversee the Violence Prevention Task Force, which was um, reconstituted in uh, the end of the summer, beginning of the fall this year. Uh, the Violence Prevention Task Force is comprised of senior officials of the executive branch and includes the Agency of Human Services, Agency of Education, ADS, uh, Departments of Public Safety, Children and Families, Mental Health, Department of Health, and Department of Cor Corrections. And as you can see, uh, probably a theme is developing that we are all working together through the enterprise. Um, a multidisciplinary approach is how I often refer to the Violence Prevention Task Force. And the reason for this is to bring all of our resources together, all of our expertise together in how we can approach reaching our goals. Um, the task force goals are looking at areas where changes can be, and changes and improvements can be made to prevent violent crimes and hold offenders accountable. In addition to also, as was mentioned earlier, providing uh, resources as to individuals as well. Um, what we have done uh, since the task force began meeting in the early fall of this year is we worked to identify gaps in policy and identify areas that we can fill those gaps. Um, we worked, as I mentioned, collaboratively, collaboratively um, among these agencies, again, to bring um, all of our resources together and break out of those, those silos. So some of the work that um, we really so far have, have concentrated on is criminal justice and school safety have been um, focuses for us among other things, but these primarily will fold into uh, some of the, the work that will now go over to the legislative session. Um, we looked at modifying current laws in areas of violent acts for um, 
uh, bail consideration. So that's one of the areas we're looking at in terms of um, policy changes. Uh, we're looking at um, identifying some gaps in some of the drug offenses, um, identifying some areas in youthful offender and delinquency cases. Um, Jay had mentioned earlier um, competency and insanity uh, evaluations and then um, universal sealing of records. So those are a couple of areas where, again, we aren't uh, rewriting um, a completely new section of law, but we're looking at some gaps in existing policy where we feel that some changes can be made um, to um, better enhance our ability um, to to hold offenders accountable um, in the criminal justice system. Um, the other area of focus has been on school safety, and this is an area where um, we are looking at enhancing um, several different parts of school safety. And those would include um, emergency preparedness for schools, and that is updating um, school drill requirements to include option space response drills, um, all hazard, having schools um, have all hazards emergency operations plans. Um, they are required to at this point, but what we're asking for is to enhance that to meet, that their emergency operations plans meet a um, template um, that is provided through the Vermont School Safety Center. Um, looking at schools, uh, requiring that schools have controlled access and visitor management so that exterior doors of schools are locked and anybody coming into the school has to check in so we're aware of who's coming into the school buildings. And then behavioral threat assessment teams. And I want to just go into a little bit more detail about this part. Um, the behavioral threat assessment teams, uh, we're looking at requiring that for supervisory unions and school districts. And what a behavioral threat assessment team is, it's embedded into a, a district, in, in our case in Vermont, what we're moving toward. And it's a multidisciplinary team made up of school administrators, school counselors, mental health professionals, teachers, um, could be coaches. Um, and these teams um, look at if there's a, a threat of violence or self-harm that becomes apparent or known um, within the school. That team does an assessment of that threat and determines you know, uh, what level this threat rises to. Is it a serious threat or is it a minor threat? Um, is it a threat to others? Is it a threat to self, of self-harm? And then that team works to, um, I, to, with that individual student and develop a comprehensive plan to work with that student whether that and provide resources, whether that be mental health or counseling or mentoring. Um, but each individual threat assessment that's done, uh, an individual working plan is developed and that that team develops for that individual student. And the idea here is to bring that student into the um, school community, into the fold of the school community. And that's um, really important for a number of different reasons, but initially, the first part of that is instead of responding to threats, we're looking at preventing any threatening actions happening. So we're trying to get this at the earliest possible point in time and work with that student, providing resources um, that are available for us to, again, bring that student into the community fold. So that's a little bit about what behavioral threat assessment teams are and what that process is. But that's another thing that we're looking to um, require of schools um, as part of the work that we're doing with policy. Um, I would also um, just want to add that the Vermont School Safety Center, which is, um, which is a model of um, cooperation between the Agency of Education, is a partnership between the Agency of Education and the Department of Public Safety. And the Vermont School Safety Center, if you go to the website, it's Vermont School Safety Center, um, you will see an, a, an incredible number of resources that are available to school administrators, to teachers, to mental health professionals, to school counselors, to coaches, everything from how to develop an emergency operations plan, um, to be, other um, resources available for behavioral threat assessments, um, it's just an incredible um, 
amount of, of support resources for schools. And going back to um, behavioral threat assessments, the Vermont School Safety Center has done an incredible job of bringing training to the state and has already um, trained upwards of 500 um, folks in the process of behavioral threat assessments and developing teams and conducting those assessments. And we'll be um, continuing on that with providing train the trainer program in January, at the end of January. And what that will allow us is to build a cadre of behavioral threat assessment trainers within the state who can then go to schools and school districts and continue this, this training and this um, support for school districts in um, continuing to, to work in this direction. So um, that is, in a very short nutshell, um, the work that we've been doing with the Violence Prevention Task Force and some of the key areas that we've been focusing on so far uh, since we've um, been meeting in, uh, since the fall. Yes. I have a question uh, regarding the school safety piece of it. Um, so um, I read Uvalde, um, the, the report done by the Texas House of Representatives on the Uvalde school shooting. And they, uh, according to that report, had um, every plan in place. And if you were to look at the plan, you would think it's a, a great plan that they were going to be able to prevent any sort of violence occurring in their school. But the actual facts on the ground, what the Texas House of Representatives concluded, was the actual facts on the ground didn't match the plan that was in place. There was a disconnect between plan and, and actual on the ground action. And so I'm wondering in Vermont, what are we doing to actually audit these, uh, these plans uh, in order to make sure that if a plan says something like access control, we aren't seeing doors being left open or broken locks, um, that we're seeing the ability in these plans for uh, cross-agency coordination during an emergency, such as what we saw happen in Texas, so we can make sure that you know, all the time that we're spending on these plans is actually resulting in on the ground changes uh, that are remaining consistent and that if an emergency occurs, the plan would actually be able to be implemented, unfortunately, like what, what occurred in Texas. The um, part of the um, recommendations, what we're hoping to move forward with in this session, um, does require that the school districts report back on their plan. Um, so that's one part of how we're going to assess, yes, every school has a plan. And another um, leg of that is that it has to meet certain requirements, minimum requirements, as um, set forth in the template that is provided by the Vermont School Safety Center. In terms of how do we know that uh, the, the plan is the plan, but we're also following the plan, I think it's really, if I'm understanding, is the, the root of your question. And the um, a, a couple of years ago, the Vermont School Safety Center, um, in coordination again with Department of Public Safety and uh, the Agency of Education, provided training to schools on how to conduct um, tabletop exercises and other types of, of exercises to go through those kinds of steps to say, okay, um, let's, and, and when I say emergency operations plan, um, I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, active threat, active shooter, but these plans are comprehensive. They include what to do if there's a chemical spill in the chemistry lab, what to do if there's an electrical outage, what to do if there's a crash involving a school bus. So it's all encompassing um, all hazards emergency operations plan. So to go back, the, um, the, these training, these tabletop uh, trainings that we put out to the school and taught the, the schools how to do these exercises was to do exactly, I think, what, what you're focusing on is, okay, this is the incident. Um, we've got a, a school bus, it's, it's sub-zero temperatures, stuck in a snowbank, and we gotta figure out how we're gonna get these kids off into a warm, safe place. And so they work through that tabletop exercise and identify, oh, we have a gap in our communications plan. We need to enhance that. So those are the kinds of things that have been done in the past to assist schools in sort of doing a, a dry run um, of those kinds of things. Um, so that, that, has, um, that has been done. Um, but we're also looking at in, in these policies that, we're, um, that we've been working on for this session, 
is also identifying, for instance, the, the annual training, ensuring that that is happening for behavioral threat assessments. Um, and I think this is really a start for us in Vermont by having these, these mandates or these requirements. And it's a first step and this will be built upon. So, you know, I think we're taking our baby steps and then looking at, okay, um, what's, what's next? And that, you know, it, it could be, okay, how are we going to start tracking, um, you know, training? You know, how many trainings has a school done? Those kinds of things. But that's, you know, again, in the future, something to, to, to build toward. Um, so I didn't, don't know if that answered your question. And, okay. Yeah, it did, so that seems where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, we're at the first first stages of this, and you know, along the lines of um, some of the things that Commissioner Morrison talked about, for instance, the heat map. We're just starting off. Um, we know we have a ways to go, but this is our our first steps in that direction. We we're at five fifteen. Um, so this is this is the first of six that we'll do. Uh, we'll do two more this week. Uh, next week there are three additional uh, one-hour briefings, introductory briefings on a whole range of topics. Uh, Kendall has sent you all the, the list of, of briefings. We would love to see you all at all of them. Uh, if anything changes, we'll let you know. Uh, we have some notes here uh, to follow up with some folks, but by all means, if there is uh, something specific that you would like from us or if you think of something, down the road that, um, that you'd like us to address, just let us know, we'd be happy to get you the information. Um, as, as the conversation in the legislature moves forward, I have no doubt that the Judiciary Committees in particular are gonna jump into a number of those uh, details at the top of D slide uh, uh, with great vigor. Um, I would point out in one case, uh, the universal sealing of records, the governor mentioned Thursday that we have some sincere, well-intentioned expungement policy uh, that we need to uh, evaluate uh, because right now that expungement policy would, would allow someone who commits a violent crime as a young adult to go on to purchase a firearm in the future. Uh, whereas if they were a little older, they'd be prohibited from owning a firearm or purchasing a firearm um, uh, uh, under current law. So these are, uh, that's one example of the type of modification that we're proposing uh, to make it. We'll, we'll work with the Judiciary Committees in a little bit more detail on that. That's the overview. Again, if anybody has any questions, you can grab any, any of us. We'd be happy to uh, follow up with you. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.